panel. We're missing one of the paper givers, but hopefully we'll be able to deal with this. Um, you can present the paper if you need to do it, too, right? Um, <coughs> I'm not sure I really, well, let me introduce everybody. You can see their signs. I'm Margaret Levy, and I'm at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences and in the Political Science Department here, the director of the center, has been. Um, next to me is Federica Cargute, Cargate, close enough, um, who's currently at Indiana University at the um, Ostrom Center there. Um, Gillian Hatfield. Jillian. Jillian. <laughs> Should have practiced. I know. <laughs> I know all these people. Let's see what you do to Barry's name. Larry, right? <laughs> <laughs> and bomb over there. <laughs> Okay, so Jillian Hatfield from USC Law School, and Barry Weingast from um, Political Science and Hoover at Stanford, and Tom Ginsburg, who I believe is still at the University of Chicago <laughs> Law School, but I know lots of places are trying to get him to move. Um, we're going to start with a paper on Athens, and so I was told to stop Jillian. Stop, stop me at seven. At seven. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm trying to make sure that I don't cut Frederica off. So, uh, let's see. Where's our clicker? Um, can people hear me if I don't? We, we actually would love for you oh, to Oh, okay. Talk All right. All right, I, will, I promise I will do that. Um, okay, so uh, this paper is the second one that the three of us have written together. It's number seven in the series for uh, Barry and I on uh, work that we've been pretty excited about over the last several years. So, um, and I'm just going to try and briefly uh, uh, give you a sense of where this paper sits. So, the the work that that uh, that we've been doing has said, okay, most people start thinking about law. We define law when we analyze it as the, the set of rules created by government and enforced. And therefore, when you're thinking about building rule of law in places that don't have it or don't have very effective legal systems, it looks like the challenge is to build rule of law and, and therefore increase wealth. You need to create governments that legislate and enforce. But that's a catch-22 because poor countries don't have the wealth required for effective governments and enforcement. So it's like, where do you, where do you start on this? Uh, the, the paper that uh, Barry and I first wrote in, tw in 2012 called What is Law uh, takes a very different theoretical approach to the idea of law and really emphasizes that what's critical about law is law is a centralized classification institution that tells us what is and is not acceptable or punish uh, non-punishable behavior. And we don't start with the assumption that that means centralized enforcement. In fact, we build up the model in the context of decentralized enforcement, of which we mean enforcement by ordinary people, which is the way normative systems, social norm systems, which have maintained social order in human societies for hundreds of thousands of years, uh, that's how they operate, by decentralized, ordinary uh, uh, people participating. And we're not going to play with you. We're going to throw you out, um, and so on. And then we look theoretically at what that means in terms of the requirement of what your set of rules and your classification institution has to look like in order to incentivize and coordinate that decentralized enforcement. Uh, and by looking at the incentive compatibility of the legal institutions that are necessary to uh, maintain equilibrium legal order, we actually derive the solution that it's because you have to coordinate and incentivize ordinary people to participate in enforcement that law has to have the kinds of characteristics we think of as legal attributes. So we, Lon Fuller and his list of eight or seven or eight things that law has to look like, we actually are able to derive those plus some additional ones out of our model as a positive prediction of what it takes to maintain equilibrium. And the ones we emphasize in particular are uh, the, the requirement that rules and enforcement, that these are not just the announced rules, these are the ones that are actually being enforced, is a matter of common knowledge. I know that you know that everybody knows that if I show up or if I exclude somebody, I have confidence everybody else is doing the same thing on the same basis. Um, that those rules are implemented with neutrality and based on impersonal reasoning, impersonal in part so that everybody can reproduce it. I don't need to know what the, uh, the, the Solomon says. I can look at the system and say, I can predict both what I should be doing, but also what other people will be enforcing. So should I show up? And neutrality is coming out of the idea that I don't want to play if it's not uh, neutral. Uh, 
if you think about the incentive compatibility constraint that says we need to be in incentivized to uphold this system, there's got to be benefits to that equilibrium for everybody who's playing along. That's a really important feature. We call this universality. There are others that come out of it, but I won't, I won't spend time on those. So in our paper, uh, the three of us uh, from 2015 on building legal order in ancient Athens, uh, and ancient Athens is uh, Federica knows everything about law in ancient Athens, it is to be known, um, is that we approach this using this model from the idea of building equilibrium legal order. The thing that makes Athens such a fantastic model for thinking through the developing world, we think, is it's an environment without uh, public institutions of enforcement. Enforcement is conducted by private individuals um, uh, it, private individuals. So we have centralized classification, but with large scale, 6,000 person assembly and adjudication in uh, large scale juries, uh, uh, that's 200, 400, up to 6,000. Uh, these are large scale, deeply embedded in the population, uh, enforced by ordinary citizens. And we argue that though that set of institutions there, uh, was deliberately designed, or at least ended up being designed uh, to achieve common knowledge qualified universality, which means incentives for the citizens, which is 30,000 of the 200,000, 250,000 in the population, uh, that citizens have an incentive uh, to enforce um, neutrality and openness, by which we mean, and this is going to be an important point for this paper, continuity with existing norms. You do not just come in and plop down a whole bunch of new law. You have to make sure it's consistent with uh, existing norms to, to satisfy your incentive compatibility constraint. So what are we doing in this paper? Uh, we want to look at, at how you extend access uh, to a legal order, an equilibrium legal order, for initially excluded and disfavored groups. So we start off in Athens with just 30,000 citizens. How do you expand that? That's a clear challenge for building legal order in developing uh, uh, settings. And our key observation is that it was incremental and incentive compatible for citizens. Those who were already benefiting had to see benefits to the extension of access. Um, and we're, we're going to suggest that there are four principles that come out of this. Uh, it was continued reliance on ordinary people. Uh, it was integrated into the common knowledge structures that were grounding the equilibrium to begin with. There were limited costs and very tangible benefits to the citizens who had to be willing to participate in taking this step and continuity with existing norms so that there's an existing citizen, non-citizen distinction and this is preserved. But uh, Federica is going to tell us more about the, the details of how that really worked. That was well below seven minutes. Oh, super. Now you can talk forever. <laughs> I won't. I won't. No, no, don't. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just take five minutes. So what happens, the, the major shift that we're looking at um, is, uh, uh, occurs in the middle of the history of, of democratic Athens. And through how, basically throughout the history of the Athenian democracy, uh, the law courts were and remained the domain of adult male citizens. Um, in the middle of the 4th century BCE, um, the Athenians extend uh, access to legal institutions, uh, to the courts, uh, to known citizens. Um, for commercial cases involving a written contract providing for trade to or from the port of Athens, Piraeus. Um, the commercial cases are heard in the popular courts as other cases, um, and access is limited, is limited insofar as known citizens can participate as litigants and not as jurors, and I will come back to this. Um, as, a, as an important feature. Um, so why uh, does the change come about? Why the decision to extend access? Um, I'm gonna summarize 200 years of history in like three sentences right now, so bear with me. Uh, the basic story and Most the Most of us couldn't challenge you. Right, <laughs> fair enough. But the basic story is one of change over time whereby in the fifth century, Athens is at the head of a multi-city empire. Uh, and the empire brings a lot of revenues to the city. Uh, and the revenues are used to fund the Athens prosperity and uh, its democratic institutions um, and so forth. Um, at the end of the fifth century, Athens engages in a 27-year-old war with her rival, Sparta. Um, and Athens loses the war. Um, and uh, as a, on, on account of losing the war, Athens also loses the empire, uh, which means that it loses its major source of revenues. Um, in the fourth century, uh, the uh, Athenian policy can be seen as revolving around one fundamental question. And the question is, how are we, how can we um, uh, increase revenues in the absence of the empire 
in a way that does not upset, that will not upset the fragile uh, post-war uh, social order. Um, and there are a series of alternatives that are tried. Uh, uh, there are some proposals to extend citizenships, uh, full citizenship, to economic actors. Um, and another proposal is, or another attempt, is that of rebuilding the empire, moving, um, uh, like going and like trying to uh, re or, or exploit um, um, uh, previously uh, subjected cities. And neither of these uh, options work for reasons that I obviously don't have time to get into uh, here. Uh, but by the middle of the fourth century, it becomes clear from the evidence that Athens has embarked on a new path. And the path involves extending access to institutions, including but not limited to the law courts, um, to actors involved in the uh, uh, sector of the Athenian economy that has the most promise, which is maritime trade. Uh, the com so, and, and this is the, the, the shift that we're looking at. Uh, the commercial cases, the Dika and Porikai, differ from uh, other cases heard in the popular courts, not only because uh, non-citizens, including foreigners, there's an aliens, and even some slaves um, can participate as litigants, uh, but also because of the rapidity with which uh, uh, judgments are uh, uh, provided um, and for more rigorous means of enforcement. Um, so this is important. Um, Pre-trial bail is one of them. Post-trial detention is another one. So Gillian has been speaking about the extent to which Athenian enforcement was decentralized. Uh, Post-trial detention seems to indicate a greater role for the state in enforcement. It turns out that the state provides the prison, literally. And the practice of bringing people to jail, the practice of enforcement as we might conceptualize of it, remains in the hands of private individuals. Um, it is exceedingly difficult to link the uh, establishment of these commercial cases and other uh, um, uh, aspects of the extension of access with uh, Athenian prosperity, with any aspect of Athenian prosperity, because of the evidence. But um, uh, and we are not we're not aiming at establishing causality in any shape or form. But um, the evidence does suggest that as Athens extends access to uh, institutions, particularly to the courts, uh, the city's prosperity soars. Uh, and the absence of uh, uh, episodes of social unrest indicates that the extension of access was compatible with uh, so the, the maintenance and the preservation of the social order. Um, we suggest, based on uh, the model in the previ our previous work, that the success was based on four principles. First of all, the commercial cases, uh, in the commercial cases, uh, the Athenians continue to rely on ordinary people. Uh, limited state intervention enforcement remains in the hands of private individuals. The, can, the new cases were integrated into those common knowledge structures, uh, namely the popular courts, where adjudication was large scale, public, participatory, and enforcement as well. Uh, the introduction of the, of the new tribunals uh, involved limited costs and tangible benefits for both citizens and non-citizens. Uh, again, the fact that these cases were heard in courts that existed uh, meant that the sunk cost of creating courts was had already been incurred, um, and the uh, particip par participants in the courts uh, benefited from speedy adjudication of their disputes. That's something that merchants care about, it turns out. Um, and uh, the Athenians themselves benefited from increased trade in a post-imperial dimension. Um, uh, last, uh, uh, the, the aspect that Gillian was flagging earlier, continuity with existing norms. The introduction of these tribunals was not a complete uh, transformation of the practice of normal practice in the law courts. Uh, access was limited to commercial cases for trade to and from Piraeus. And most important of all, the cardinal principle of the Athenian democracy, which is that citizens are um, ultimately the judges uh, of what goes on in the courts, was not um, taken away. So. We, um, again, as, as Gillian uh, pointed out, against the practice of building uh, legal order through the establishment of uh, 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 usually centralized uh, legal institutions, typical um, uh, often of the developed West, we highlight Athens', Athens <coughs> very pragmatic, first of all, uh, and very gradual uh, extension of access and the hope that it might be useful to think um, for um, how to, uh, to help, how to establish legal orders um, in um, developing countries. Thank you. Very thank you, slave for the questions. <laughs> He's just I'm being smart. pretty. Just sitting <laughs> here. Um, and John Way introduced in absentia is now here. <laughs> John Fair John from NYU Law School and previously Stanford. So you have fifteen minutes you two to present. Are you dividing it up? Yeah. 
Do you want to talk? No, no, you go ahead. I'm going to try to discuss it. You're even less coordinated than I was. I'm glad you showed up. I got confused by the time. It pointed me in the direction I went to the new faculty table. Yeah, you know. And there's a faculty lounge there. Does the, it have the name Manning? The, the name of your. The name of your. Oh, it's. Um, no. It's none of that. Go to the removable disk. Click on that one. Then it's. Arbitration? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. You put slideshow? Yeah, I sure will. And then there's your clicker. Okay. And it's up on full screen on there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is a paper that um, uh, Tom Ginsberg and Richard Holden, uh, who's an economist at the University of New South Wales, and I have worked on for a little while. And the idea is to uh, get some intuition about the possibilities of arbitration in an anarchical situation, where that's distinguished from a situation in which there's a background of law or some kind of social norm. So. So the, we're going to have to model anarchy. So let's give you some intuition about how this might work. And our particular question is, is it possible to have something resembling neutral norm enforcement, which I'll define in a minute, in an anarchical situation? Right, so, so let's, I clicked something and nothing happened. Something happened. Oh. OK. <laughs> is this no, no, no. visual representation of anarchy? It is, yeah. <laughs> Actually, usually it's pretty much more crowded than that. <laughs> if it was empty, it would be peaceful. <laughs> Which one do I push? Probably not the alt button. Yeah. <laughs> what do I push to click ahead? Okay. okay, so, uh, okay, the right side, okay. So we start with the idea of a triad, which is familiar from to political scientists from uh, an old book of uh, E.E. Schatzneider in which Schatzneider's model of a triad or idea of a triad was there's two people fighting, there's a crowd, around, a crowd around them cheering, and one guy seems to be losing, so he appeals to the crowd to intervene. Right? So the, the appeal is to a powerful third party. That's the triad. You know, there's two, and, and, and the, uh, uh, the assumption is that the, the crowd is more powerful than either one. So the crowd, crowd could impose order if it wants to, or impose chaos, either one. So the more familiar one in, in law is the one from Martin Shapiro, the idea of a third party being somebody who disputes settles disputes, dis what I would say, epistemically, that is by finding a solution either in law or in the party's interest. So the core idea of Shapiro's is there's something about dispute resolution that requires negotiation, bargaining, and making it, first of all, attractive for disputants to come before the arbitrator or court, and secondly, to go through with uh, compliance with the, with the suggestion or order that it, that it emerges. So, so the idea is, though, that the Shapiro arbitrator is not necessarily powerful at all. He only has one power, which is a cognitive power, a power to find good solutions when good's going to be defined in a few minutes. So here's a classical story of a Shapiro-like arbitrator. It's found in Achilles' shield in the Iliad. So Kroll bro has broken out between two men who struggled over the blood prize for a kinsman who was just murdered, and one declaimed in public um, a vowing payment in full. The other spurned him. He would not take a thing, which meant he wanted to go kill the person. Uh, the crowd cheered them both, They both, and they took sides. Harold's held them back as the city elders. The city elders are going to be the third party. Uh, sat on polished stone benches, performing, forming the sacred circle, grasping in hand the staffs of clear, of the clear-voiced clear heralds, and each leapt to his feet to plead his case in turn. Two bars of solid gold shone on the ground before them, a prize for the judge who would speak the straightest verdict. All right, so that's, so the idea, there was a bunch of judges who were, who were potential third party arbiters, you know, and they competed for this gold prize for, give the, for giving the best verdict. And that was decided essentially by the crowd and maybe the other elders together. Right? So, so this is, so, so there's no enforcement. This is, you know, like in the previous paper, there's no enforcement, no centralized enforcement. All, all that's being done by these group of elders is to announce that this is the right thing to do. In other words, give that, that guy, give the first guy the money or else he can go kill the person or whatever. You know, in other words, it's, it's just a judgment about, about what is okay to do, all right? So it's a suggestion, and uh, presumably, suggestion would be expected to be followed, which means it's ex post incentive compatible. And it's also, as you can see, ex ante incentive compatible in which the parties desire to come before these elders and ask for the, for the judgment. So it's got these two properties, which we're gonna take advantage of in a minute. Here's another example of Pashtun Wali, which is the customary law of the Pashtun area of uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. So disputes are normally dis resolved by a jurga, or often dis resolved by a council, a jurga, um, who are members of the, 
community, who I think are mostly wise men in the community. Uh, the juror, each, each adult member of the community will speak and deliberate, will, the deliberation will proceed until there's agreement on the proper resolution of the case. There's an emphasis on voluntary acceptance by the parties. Um, there's uh, no monopoly of dispute resolutions. There's others that can provide the service, such as mullers or chiefs. And there's a fair amount of self-help. If you look at the paper, you'll see there's self-help as well. In this situ situation, the job of the dispute resolvers is to contain conflict by working out immediate solution, one that likely takes into account both the material strengths of the parties as well as their compliance with community norms. So, so again, these two constraints I mentioned, ex ante incentive compatibility, the parties want to appear and make and appeal the dispute, and ex post incentive compatibility, which means the parties are willing to go through with the recommendation once it's suitably deliberated in the jurga. So that's another example. So the types of disputes, so we, you know, one model is the legal system, which is familiar in arbitration cases where that's the shadow that it casts over arbitration. Um, second is an informal or, primitive, informal or primitive legal system, which these two examples I just gave you are examples of that. And then pure anarchy is where there is no community norm or community. There's just a pure anarchical situation. That's what I'm going to mostly focus on. But I think we're, we're contemplating that our work will apply to the primitive legal system. And in a limit, it would apply to a legal system too, although the notions of uh, power and strength will be somewhat different. So anarchy, we model it this way. There's pairwise disputing. That is, there's um, from heaven a prize falls between two people. They fight, or they could fight, right? So um, each person uh, knows their own strength, but they don't know the strength of the other. So they're uncertain about the person they're like you know, they're going to fight over with the prize, fight for the prize over, and. Um, and so fighting is costly in the sense that <coughs> if a fight happens and both parties will have to surrender some resources, it'll just be dead weight loss, right? So, so they would prefer if they could find a way not to fight, not to fight. But of course, the stronger thinks he ought to win and the weaker, uh, of course, the stronger doesn't know he's stronger, actually, ex ante. So, so of course, the party, when it comes to the conclusion that it's weak, might just desert the field and not fight at all. So, so as is familiar, for those of you who've read Hobbes, you know that you know, Hobbes depicts the state of nature as nasty, brutish, and short. And there's, and there's a literature on Hobbes which indicates that there's much dispute about whether there's actually any fighting in the state of nature. It may be the case that the weak parties just leave the field. And what's, what's actually going on is nothing. <laughs> you know, it's like a, you know, just the strong parties wander around, pick up stuff, and the weak parties just concede. So it's, it's not clear how much actual fighting there is, but there is a sense of domination and intimidation. So it's an unpleasant place to live, this anarchy. All right. So arbitration. So the idea of arbitration is Again, the arbitrators are not powerful people. They, they have just one capacity, if they have any, which is they may have a capacity to make, uh, in this case, uh, good estimations of the strengths of the relative strengths of the parties. So if the parties come to them, somehow <coughs> the arbitrator can adopt procedures or gather evidence which uh, they will you know, attest to, saying, well, if it, if it comes to a fight, this party will win. Right? So that's all they can do. They don't have any power to enforce anything. All right, so, um, and I make a distinction, we make a distinction between impartial arbitration, which I'll talk about in a second, and neutral arbitration. Impartial is, arbitration is where, where the arbitrator also offers a solution that takes account of only relevant features of the disputants. In the state of nature, the only relevant feature of the disputants is how the powerful they are, <laughs> right? So, so an impartial arbitrator in the state of nature always decides for the strong party, right? So that's, right, whereas in other situations, he might try, you know, decide for the party who's legally correct. But, in this case, that won't happen. So it's just about strength. A neutral arbitrator, on our definition, um, uh, her offers can, the offer of a neutral arbitrator can reflect a party independent neutral norm. So the norm we're going to talk about now is just equal division, but it could be any norm and make this work. So we just, it's just a matter of simplifying notation to use that particular one. So we have about five minutes left. judges normally impose neutral norms. The neutral norm in the case of the judge would be the, the norm coming from the legal system, developed a dispute. Arbitrators may not be able to do this, even if all parties would want such a norm to be applied ex ante. That is to say that the application of a neutral norm in the state of nature, in the anarchical state, would probably violate ex post instead of compatibility, which means it wouldn't be compli complied with. So that's the problem. So the model here, I'm not going to go into it, but basically it's just what I said. So the party's strength is modeled by the cost of fighting. Low cost fighter is strong. High cost fighter is weak. Pro P is probably the strong type. K is the cost of arbitration. We assume that. As I said, the cost of private information, that is, each party knows its own cost, but it doesn't know the cost of the other type. There's two stages. The first stage is the parties can request an arbitrator or not, and then 
and then if they if an arbitrator is, is made available, then the game is over. He just arbitrates, and they and he will make an arbitration which respects ex post ex incentive compatibility and will be complied with. And if not, then they have to decide whether to fight or not. That's fight versus don't fight. So, all right. So here's the equilibria. Uh, there's basically two kinds. There's pooling equilibria, which is where both parties play the same strategy. One is not very interesting, which is both parties play don't request an arbitrator and fight. Um, with, with these parameter restrictions, that makes that's rational for them. So the more interesting one is again another pooling equilibrium where both party, where the strong party requests an arbitrator and fights if he doesn't get one, if there isn't one, and the weak party um, well, plays the same thing. That is, uh, arbitrate and fight. The reason the weak party is willing to fight in that second equilibrium is he learns nothing in the first stage. So if he's willing to fight in the first stage, he's certainly willing to fight now. So that will support uh, a no fighting equilibrium. So it'll be more efficient. In fact, that's the only efficient one. There's a separating equilibrium in which the strong party refuses an arbitration and is going to fight, and the weak party arbitrates and doesn't fight. The reason the weak party doesn't fight following the failure to appoint an arbitrator is that now he knows <laughs> that, the, that the other party has to be strong because the other party is, you know, if he meets another party that doesn't request arbitration, he knows that guy's strong. That's, that's the equilibrium. So that's less efficient because there is some fighting, but it's better than nothing. So. All right, then neutral equilibria, we verify the same things. The basic claim about nuclear equilibria is that, is that while there's always the possibility of arbitration with impartial, equilib with impartial equilibrium, with impartial arbitration, under neutral arbitration, there's not always this possibility. In fact, the only possibilities for arbitration are where this inequality uh, in the third line is, the third text line is satisfied. That is where the uh, CL minus K over one minus P is greater than B over two which means basically that fighting is costly for the low-cost fighter, that there are not too many, um, uh, uh, not too many strong, you know, low-cost fighters, strong fighters, and where the benefits are not so big as to tempt the parties into reneging on agreements. So, so basically it's very restrictive, so it means that very often neutral arbitration is not available. So there's some uh, options here for how you might uh, find neutral arbitration even in anarchy, and one would be that the arbitrator actually is able to accumulate power more than just cognitive power. <coughs> Secondly, that there are reputational equilibria in which the parties are going to, there's repeated play, so the parties can uh, come back again and fight again. Uh, third is the arbitrator can redistribute awards ex post, so we can just re reshuffle awards so, does, so as to satisfy the incentive constraint. And then finally, that the arbitrator can make credible promises. These are developed in the paper if you want to look. Uh, credible promises, that is to invite the parties to post bonds that allow an ex post redistribution. Those are all ways of getting neutrality, even when, even in an anarchical situation. But each of them requires that the arbitrator have somewhat more than pure cognitive authority. So the next, all right. So then we'll go to this. So then we take that basic micro model, or those models, models and uh, reflect on state theory. So state theory would be an account of the th account of the existence of the state and its authority. So the first option is neo Hobbesian, which is the Schatzschneider theory, which is it's the physical power of the crowd for Schatzschneider, which made him an attract which made it an attractive arbitrator, right? So so it's the capacity of the crowd to impose order, which makes it, you know, attractive for others to show up and ask for its help. All right. The epistemic theory of Shapiro, the arbitrator can find a best solution, so he has a skill or a capacity to make judgments. And this is attractive to both strong and weak disputants, as you can see in both the impartial case and to some extent in the neutral case. Um, the question is, is there a dynamic theory? Can a cognitively able arbitrator leverage his capacity into physical power? One way you might imagine that happening is if there's a wedge between the cost of fighting and the cost of arbitration, <coughs> then the arbitrator in principle could charge a rent and he could accumulate rents and those rents are commensurable with the, with the cost, of, cost of fighting. So, so in principle he could throw his accumulated resources on one side of the scale or another. So if over time an arbitrator can accumulate power, there's an opp opportunity to leverage cognitive into physical power. Um, how about anti-contractualism? Can the parties agree on neutral norms prior to the learning their strengths and either empower a smart arbitrator, who can find that, or find intermediate solutions, that is bond posting, which I discussed a second ago, to relax the incentive constraint. So that's another option, which is the parties agree in advance on a neutral norm, right, and they find an institutional structure to supplement the arbitrator's cognitive power with in order to make his offer is ex post incentive compatible. That's, that's another option. And then finally, there's a question at the end, five, about whether competition among arbitrators mm -hmm. drives K down. That is to say, does the cost of arbitration decline with arbitration? 
So, and then finally, are there scale economies to arbitration? That is, is somebody who arbitrates a lot of disputes able to be successful? And here's an example of scale economies. DOC the Mead, the median, the median voter. So he was, uh, this is in Herodotus. Herodotus is, the first, is sometimes called the first historian and is also sometimes called the, ma the major his, uh, use, user of lies in historical literature. So, so take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> so Dasus was a man of mark in his own village. He applied himself to the private practice of justice among his fellows. He apparently was cognitively powerful. He could decide you know, on the merits of cases and strengths. And presently, the men of his village, observing his integrity, chose him to be the arbiter of all their disputes. He showed himself an honest and upright judge. The number of complaints brought before him continually increased as people learned more about the fairness of his judgment. Diocese, feeling himself now all important, announced that he did not intend any more to hear cases and appeared no more in the seat in which he'd been accustomed to sit and administer justice. Hereupon, robbery and lawlessness broke out afresh and prevailed, th and prevailed throughout the country even more than before. Presently, all agreed he should be king. So I didn't go into this part. They made him king by building him an, a, 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 large, powerful, a large palace, giving him an army, and essentially allowing him to create a security state, which allowed him to um, uh, basically watch everybody pretty closely. So Diocese collected the Medes into a nation and ruled over them, over them alone you know, for 53 years, as it turns out. So here's an example of somebody who grew from you know, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 an arbiter with with, um, with merely cognitive capacities into a very physically powerful king. So it's an example of this dynamic story that I suggested. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Tom, I assume you have nothing to add since you no, used no, 15 minutes. Since we used <laughs> 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 okay. So let me keep an eye on the clock. And Federica, you can, st you can time me if you want. <laughs> no more than 10 minutes and hopefully less. So there are a couple of things. This, these were great papers, as you heard, um, great papers to read. They're both uh, really rich in, okay, sorry. Well, dioceses is not such a bad thing. Um, sorry, it came back up because I can't, is that okay? Can, can I just shut it? <laughs> <laughs> There's an easier way to do this than I can see it. Um, so as I said, they're both really good papers. Um, and the presentations were fantastic because they're dense papers and I was prepared to help you understand them. So I've got all kinds of comments to prepare that sort of help lead you through the papers again, but I'm not sure I have to spend much time on that given the quality of the presentations. But there are some things that are common to both papers, and I want to sort of, instead of commenting on each paper, I really want to talk about the larger issues that they convey. And I think um, there's some consistencies and some inconsistencies between them that are worth further exploration. So both, even though they talk about, um, and the second paper explicitly talks about anarchy, I would argue that both papers really, for the most part, assume a pre-existing society, albeit not a centralized coercive state or a fully functioning court system um, with strong enforcement powers. So it's more, it's closer to the sort of primitive legal system than to the full-blown Habesian anarchy, even in the second paper for the most part. Both of them are seeking ways um, to achieve social order that can, uh, that can um, attain dispute resolution without resorting to violence. So both of them, in a way, are dealing with the violence problem that Barry and Doug North and uh, John Wallace addressed, though not necessarily explicitly, but there's this underlying theme in both of them is how do we achieve order without violence in situations where there is a tendency to resort to violence. Um, all three of them, all, all, both of them, <laughs> there may have been another one, um, has, uh, has assumed societies that have norms about behavior, though those norms come into play more effectively in some conditions than in others or more explicit in some conditions than in others. Uh, both consider uh, the importance of reputations of probity, at least on some dimension. Um, not just reputations of physical or military strength. 
So some capacity to uphold whatever is determined on the basis of something other than simply capacity to beat the other person um, into the earth if there isn't agreement. Both, in a way, um, relate to social mechanisms of enforcement, following the law merchant or Magribe traders, which are referenced um, in at least one of the papers. So incentives in based on inclusion in a commercial or other valuable network or system. That's part of what makes these incentive compatible. Both have positive predictions that are derived and then used to understand variations and assess contextual changes um, from the general model that helps to then uh, provide more uh, strength to the models. Both think about ways uh, to develop institution building, but also state building in both historical and contemporary periods. So both papers at least hand wave at how what they are describing applies to conditions of development in the contemporary world. I think more or less successfully, but there's some real theory here that I think we can use to build that. And um, finally, uh, both make the argument, um, both have some claims about paths to legal and economic development following on that last point. OK, let me look at each of these papers and then return to some common themes. So the paper on Athens, as you heard, was based on earlier work that conceptualized <coughs> law as an equilibrium legal order organized around a central classification system scheme, establishing what is and what is not punishable, but supported primarily by decentralized enforcement. They then make po positive predictions that aim to figure out how to regain this equilibrium in the situation of Athens where it's gone out of equilibrium because of changes over time in the empire and in uh, basic uh, economic advantages than the protection and use of this particular port. They have some general principles understood in light of the particular conditions in Athens, which I think is one of the great strengths of this model, as it's demonstrated in this paper, is that you can take this very general model and then use the details of the Athenian case um, by uh, imposing the model on the case sorting out a lot of detail and figuring out what exactly the mechanisms are that are keeping the equilibrium going according to those general principles. So the principles that I'm going to focus on, they had a couple of others up there, are participation of ordinary people in enforcement, the common knowledge about classifications, the universality under tightly limited conditions, and I think that's an important thing to emphasize so that the incentives to enforce remain intact. So even though it's an extension to non-citizens, it's not to every non-citizen. Um, it's not just an open-ended process. It has to be a way in which there can be assurance that the, the norms are adopted and um, that the common <laughs> people who are, who are participating in the support of this system continue to support the system and benefit from it. So it's, that leads to the continuation of norms, but it also leads to the continuation of actual benefits that derive from maintaining this port. So you need the continuity of norms, you need the participation of the ordinary people, and they show how this is a much better explanation of what happens than some alternative theories. So that's great. What is clear in the paper and not as clear in the presentation, I thought, but I was trying to keep time, so I may have missed it. <laughs> is that Athens' homogeneity, and even the homogeneity in some ways of the people who are brought in, um, the non-citizens, really limits this case. Um, but, the mo but the motivation for change and for uh, the kind of way in which the system adapts is not limiting. I think that's, but they will have to struggle with cases which are less homogenous. Um, what, but what is the bottom line here is it's not the norms that are doing the work here, though they're an important part of the process, but really the desire to boost the economy. So the norms are doing work, but the motivation to um, create a normative system that is incentive compatible and compatible with uh, past norms is economic, not normative. Right? That's really the point. Okay, let me turn to the paper on arbitration and anarchy. 
This has more emphasis than the Athens paper on the capacity of the arbitrator. Um, and the important capacity here is cognitive. And that's the ability to assess and provide information about who is likely to win a dispute and also who, how to provide a good decision. So there are two cognitive capacities here, really. And in many ways, the most important one is, and that's the one that Menia, Menia had, mm -hmm. um, was the capacity to really figure out what was going on and who really had some strength and didn't have strength in the situation, what the world really looked like. Um, the capacity to, div to divide, to come to a good decision is another uh, kind of cognitive capacity. So this leads to the discussion of impartiality versus neutrality, which John explained. Information is much more of an issue in this argument than it was in the Athens argument. So it really depends on being able to figure out uh, one who has relative strength in these cases and what kind of enforcement is likely to occur in the world around this. What else is going on that will make the decision stick um, once the arbitrators make the decision. One of the things that this paper does, and it wasn't as developed in the presentation, is to begin to outline some of the variation and conditions under which costs of arbitration are perceived as lower than the cost of fighting or the cost of neg negotiation, again, in the absence of a fully developed court system. Um, but where there is, and one of these conditions has to do with where, the, where there is any, even some semblance of a legal system and where there is not. Um, <laughs> John says they are focusing on pure anarchy, but most of the instances that they give in the paper are either of primitive legal systems or some are even very much in the shadow of law, as we would understand it in a more developed sense. And they do go through a variety of cases which are worth exploring in the paper that are very different kinds and therefore have different implications for the kind of information and cognitive capacities that an arbitrator would need as well as whether or not they would ap appeal to impartiality, neutrality, or both. Um, there's some incredible insights from their model and cases about how hard it is to impose neutrality norms in the absence of well-developed law and judicial apparatus or the state. And I think that's, that's important for their implication for development. Um, their insights about the interaction of power and neutrality and yes, they do provide, as they claim, a nascent theory of state building, which was clearer in the presentation than the paper, I must admit. Um, and it's based, again, on knowledge or cognitive power, but it seemed far less likely an outcome, as uh, far less likely to be the source, this cognitive capacity of state building, than coercion, frankly, at least as I read the paper. Okay, my conclusion, the arguments in both of these papers ultimately rest on some kind of basis for providing incentives for complying with and enforcing determinations of punishable acts without relying on a centralized state and provide some clues as to what those incentives would look like in uh, a variation, a various sets of cases. They start giving us some conditionality and some context on that. Both papers, in this sense, advance our understanding significantly, but are also, I think, underdeveloped about uh, general principles concerning the normative, social, structural, by which I mean networks and relationships, and Paul, you've been waiting for this word, organizational um, underpinnings of, these, uh, of the societies in which this is occurring. Um, Yes, all these things vary by context, but there are also more general claims I be believe we should be able to make about each of these components, and I urge us to do so. Okay, questions? <laughs> what, Brad? Introduce yourself. So everybody should introduce themselves. Can I also just make Brad, I've really come. Um, do you want to, it looks like the, the panel wants to comment oh, so on panel. each oh, other. <laughs> But why don't I let there be some okay. questions first? Is yeah. that okay? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I see you. Um, okay, got it, got it. Um, and we have till 10 
so when you were setting this up, I couldn't help but think about Cynthia. I'm curious about the incentives to meet the arbitrator and all of the things that Huron really lays out on why it's hard to come to bargains. I don't understand why those wouldn't also apply even if you're using a third party arbitrator, which is information is still really, really costly, as Margaret said, but even more so, well, there's huge incentives to misrepresent, both to the other party, but also to, to the arbitrator. So the idea that the arbitrator is going to be able to, um, at low cost, um, come to a conclusion that ha is anything rough, that, that has good, um, correspondence with both the issue being arbitrated as well as the power of the parties seems to me to be a very, very large assumption that it's not possible. And I guess when you were giving a talk, I was waiting for talk about the international system, which is what we think of when we think about anarchy in the present sense, right? Much more common than sort of anarchy in Greece, where this isn't a system. As she pointed out, these are contexts where there are states or proto states happening. So, Brent. Get your oh, well, <laughs> sorry. Uh, which is how does this? How are we going to get at the costs, and how are we going to apply this to something like, like, in, like the international system? And is the fact that we don't see these things sort of indicative that the model is going to predict in most all cases not having successful arbitration? Right. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just trying to do Alma from um, Stanford at this time. So. I want to build on something Margaret said right at the end of her comment, which was organization. Neither, so both papers were dealing with decentralized justice systems. Neither one referred to the social form of social organization to which these are ultimately linked. Those systems are linked to what anthropologists call segmentary lineages in which people trace ancestry and therefore social relatedness to different levels of uh, ancestry that has a lot to do with violence because the coercion is based on your ability to mobilize different levels of kinsmen, depending on whether you're fighting your cousin or your second cousin or your third cousin. Uh, and uh, they apply in both cases. So, you know, this is the big insight of Fustel de Coulange, that both the Greeks and the Romans actually were organized according to these segmentary lineages. Uh, it began to deteriorate, you know, later in their history, but you can't understand that justice system without understanding the kinship system. Similarly, I don't think that there's ever a society that's lived in complete anarchy because you know these kinship systems are the basic units that people organize themselves around. And so there's no purely individualistic fight of all against all. It's really a fight of you know organized social groups, and, and this goes all the way back to climate. This is not. Uh, so I'm just wondering whether this shouldn't be a component of the understanding of, you know, the way that these systems actually work and scale and so forth. Why don't we take those two questions and I'll take two more and then um, let you all conclude. Sure. Can you have some okay, I just one yeah. okay, so I, so it, the model that I presented was a two-type a two, a two type model. There's a more general continuum of types model and then you can see very clearly in the equilibrium there that there are problems of, of misre you know, misrepresentation which impose costs. So, so it turns out in equilibrium there are, are disputes that can't be resolved. You know, so, so, but still, normally the availability of a cognitively powerful person, someone who would serve as an arbitrator and is to be that such a person, will allow for some degree of reduction in violence. Right? So, that's, so, that's, so it's not to say it solves everything, but it solves something. Right? So now you could, you could that's, but that's that's the property of the equilibrium. So that's that one. But Frank, I, I agree. I in the paper we adopt the first principle of economics in in developing an explanation, which is simplify, exaggerate. <laughs> <laughs> so you're right. Anarchy is, a, is pure anarchy is an abstraction, right? And and these cases with you know that we drew the primitive legal system examples from are much more complicated. I agree, agree completely. But you can see elements like an Achilles shield story, you know, that, you know, and some of these Jurgis stories that Tom uh, and others put together, you, know, you can see elements of, of what's going on in the arbitration itself 
or the considerations, I mean, they involve how it, how it, why do we have to pay attention to that person? Well, that's related to who he is. Who he is means how he's embedded in social structure. Right? So we're just taking for granted that the arbiter says, okay, that person's here, he's, a, he's a, somebody we need to pay attention to. The person who was killed is somebody whose family we need to pay. So that's all there, but, but you're right. We, to actually apply this to a real situation would take a lot of steps that we haven't taken. So, anyway, so. Yeah. Just to follow up on that, you could imagine that the model would sort of apply when the units of fighting are not individuals but families that are in a blood-free situation and how they resolve that. So I think mean, it may have some application. Again, we have there's other work we've done that's um, on sedimentary society, but it would be fun to try to push that a little bit to go from the Pashtuns to the Greeks to the Romans, which are all examples of that. Um, um, Margaret, I thought one point you made, you said you know, both papers assume a previous society. I think the difference between us, we're actually one step prior in a way to all the stuff Mary and Julian have been doing, uh, in that we don't assume norms, I mean, in this abstract situation. And so you imagine two people out there on the savanna, they come together and um, just simply having a fight, a raw fight. And it is, as Brad pointed out, not that, um, uh, not, not a completely abstract situation. Think about the Senate and the President now over Merrick Garland's appointment has some features of this. Yes, there are background norms for sure in that case, but I, I suppose the, the thickness of background norms is something of a continuum. And I think what we're trying to do is emphasize this very, very early, early stage. That's one of the contributions. Yeah, no, thank you, Mr. Piyama. Um, I think that the rural associations is actually uh, critical to the story that we're trying to tell, although perhaps we haven't um, discussed it enough. Um, and it's, I'm going to talk about the evidential basis and then the, the conceptual basis. And the evidential basis is that um, by the time that we see these extensions uh, um, going on, um, these are uh, rooted in a uh, um, uh, opening access to a variety of institutions, including civil associations. So what we see is that those lines, uh, 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 those segmentary lines that we, that we would imagine would apply to Asian Athens and definitely apply by the time of the shield of Achilles are actually <coughs> breaking down in a way that um, uh, uh, it indicates that no citizens are actually participating in those very social networks that they were previously excluded from. Um, insofar as the uh, uh, conceptual, um, the 2015 paper that we have uh, uses a thought experiment that indicates precisely this kind of like a falling apart of norms that we assume were in, in, in place at time A and that do not apply in time B. And the question is, if uh, 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 court judgment tells you to enforce a penalty against a, a family member um, and in uh, uh, support of a foreigner, then what do you do? And it is precisely in the, in the, in the contradiction or the uh, um, um, evolution of these norms uh, grounded on previously uh, familial and, and um, social networks that we see the, the, the benefits. So to, just to emphasize that, that, that we think that's the, a fundamental thing to explain is how do you shift from uh, a world where you decide who you're helping in a fight based on family, background, and so on, and shift it to what's the outcome of a decision of this institution. That's, that's the fundamental shift. And I would say, I just really wanted to point out a key difference in our use of incentive compatibility here between John and, and Tom's paper in, in our work. Uh, incentive compatibility of your arbitration solution was for the disputants. Mm -hmm. Incentive compatibility for us is for the enforcers. So that the community, which is to say that the reason you comply is not, I mean, yes, it obviously is better if you've got an incentive compatible solution for the disputants. But at the end of the day, they're going along with the one to whom the crowd has awarded the goal because it's incentive compatible for them to expend effort to enforce based on that outcome. So I, think that, 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 I think that's the, the, the key shift we're making. So it's not actually rooted in the norms and the benefits for those individuals, but rather for the entire community. And I bet there's a norm about using the arbitrator. Why don't we take, so Eric and then Juan, and then those will be the questions. Yeah, this this is more of a comment as Introduce one who's actually oh Eric Jensen from uh, Stanford Law School. Welcome everyone. We're so happy to have you here. Uh, I, I mine's more of a comment than a, a question because I've actually observed Jurgas in uh, the uh, uh, Northwest Frontier Province and and, and and the like. 
And what, what I see, I, uh, John's point is, is well taken on, on simplify and exaggerate. But what I see is a, a deep set of uh, social norms coming to play in Jirga uh, proceedings. Uh, some years ago, uh, Guillermo O'Donnell uh, presented a paper here at Stanford uh, entitled Five States of Legality. It went all the way from anarchy up to uh, uh, democratic rule of law. And I, I cheated and I said, you know, actually there's all five states of legality I, I can find within Pakistan itself. And I said, anarchy is represented in the, uh, the uh, uh, federal tribal areas, which it was called at the time. But I was actually lying about that. I, no one knew about the federal tribal areas back in the 1990s. I could get away with that. Uh, post 9-11, I can't get away with that anymore. But I, I just don't see uh, anarchy. I see uh, a, a strong uh, a social order. I see punishments that are virtually codified, given wh whatever crime there, sure. there, there is. I was going to the exact same direction, but a twist, which is this. The, the situation One of the Jirgas. Ah, Juan Botero uh, with the World Justice Project. The Jirga, the situation of the Jirgas is, is, is very clear and the blow face that's, that's documented. However, it is a little atypical. The more common situation is that of the chief in Liberia or Sierra Leone. The traditional chief, the customary authority in Liberia or Sierra Leone. Or the mama in the Colombian Indians or the paradero in the, uh, the Latin American Indian traditions, which is, which is more typical, in which case the source of authority is probably a combination between the Neo-Hovesian and the dynamic models. It comes part because of the blood fed, I mean, the mamas are inherited and the chiefs are inherited positions, but it also has a source of specialization because they are not richer than the rest of the community. So maybe if you go that way, that, that is actually the way it has evolved in most places around the world because the Jirgas are a little different. I mean, they are an outlier in the sense of, of the continuum of customary justice authority. My commentary. That's it. Yeah. I, I, I want to just add something to look at a juxtaposition between the two papers and, and because I think it, it helps us think a little bit about what law is about. It, it gets to the project that the three of us are working on and that Julie and I started you know, in, the, in the what is law framework. And one of the first things you said, John, was an identifying there's no law. Why well, no centralized enforcement mechanism? And that, that identification of law with centralized enforcement is almost universal in the literature. In law and economics, positive political theory in the law, that is political science and economics in the law, almost universally do that, and, and uh, we don't see a reason for that. It seems that law has to do with uh, uh, more uh, where, where there's a recognized steward or classification system, uh, a set of legal attributes uh, along the lines of law and fuller re recognized. Uh, you, you discussed some that he didn't, such as relative power. That has to work in, your, in the environment you're saying, but the question is whether or not decisions are consistent across the cases and whether or not you generate a rule of law in that regard. And there has to be a central, in some form of enforcement, but why central? I mean, what's the, what, what, is, what is that bringing to law? Other than whether or not you know, you're actually able to enforce the rules, that's a question. And maybe centralized enforcement is, is better at that, more efficient. But I don't see why that is logically necessary. And this is not simply a, 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 a you know, point about you. you know, this is, I think, gets to the heart of what it is we're asking about what is law, and, and it, you know, Jillian and I have looked in a large number of situations uh, that are outside, uh, that, that have no formal legal systems, uh, such as the California Gold Rush, Medieval Iceland, the uh, Medieval Law Merchant setting, uh, Scarbeck's work on the, uh, the prison gangs, uh, which, 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 who have constitutions within prisons, all suggest decentralized enforcement, you know. Uh, legal attributes can emerge uh, and, and the, uh, with legal stewards uh, in decentralized cases. I don't think that's a big issue for us. I mean, John just said that. But the fact is, in our framework, law is just one type of neutral norm, and it's not you know, a particularly important one. We're not, we're not, we're not so uh, <coughs> serious on state power. But, 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 but I disagree. It, it may be that you don't need centralized enforcement, and that that was just an <coughs> offhand remark. But you just want to say it's not law. Whereas I'm trying to suggest that the situation you're talking about yeah. begins to look like law to the extent that you get a system where the arbitrator begins to be consistent across cases. 
and this is my this is a common reaction to your framework, which is how do you distinguish law from other normative systems, and the classification oh, systems, and all that. Right. That is, you can imagine the right. keys the steward. But there's someone who can direct the law at particular moments, so that when you get to situations that you, you know, that, that you haven't seen before, there can be a coordination on what it is you do next when there are multiple things that might happen. So that's fine. That's it. Yeah. I, if I said that, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, because the whole point of this paper is is the application of neutral norms as an emergent notion of law, which has nothing to do with centralization at all. Right. It only has to do with when can you here, get here. that phenomenon. Yeah. When can you get that phenomenon equilibrium? That's why we such. Right. So I, if I say I don't know, I don't understand that at all. I want to agree with what you say. Is it echoed what, Mar what Margaret said too? I, you know, that is to say, that it's more likely the Hobbesian story than the Clive story for an origination of actual power in actual places, which is, I always attribute that to the fact that she was the Jewish of Chicago. I never was. Weren't you ever there? No. <laughs> <laughs> you walked by. I there. <laughs> <laughs> he likes it. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I kind of, I, but I, to answer your careful question, so, so our, our point was cognitive power can dynamically evolve into physical power, and it, and, you know, and if it does that, then that's that's good from the standpoint of norm enforcement because you can relax the intent constraints. You know, so then you get enforcement. Again, it doesn't have to be centralized, but it, it has to be something that, that relaxes the constraints on what you can what you can announce as a solution. So, so I, I don't have a disagreement about the empirical claim, which I think is largely true, that that you know often the powerful potential arbitrator is attractive to the students because it's the very fact that they're powerful makes them attractive because they can actually settle this thing as opposed to giving suggestions which may or may not be followed. So I agree with that. But John, I think there's another piece to that. I mean, so let's, even if the cognitive power then gets turned into the palace and the security state, what then maintains the cognitive capacity as a crucial part of this, power? This is a good question. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or legal. Right, or legal. I mean, so that's why if we're talking about state building, we can't just mean the moment in which somebody right. gets ruled. Um, why wouldn't it be complementary? You, so you develop well, some coercive capacity, you want to extend that, be, you want to be it's cheaper if you use the we, 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 we have we imagined that, that a great many people in power in fact become authoritarians rather than the yeah. pursuers of But many of them yeah, provide yeah. dispute resolution. But that, I, I, I don't disagree with the facts on the ground there, mm -hmm. but the question is what is the mechanism that does that? Mm -hmm. And under what conditions does it operate and under what conditions does it? And that was what my yeah, was. This isn't yeah. state building, this is, yes, yeah. an instantiation of power by a particular authority who got there one half and then used the traditional coercive power to become an authoritarian. Can I ask one question about the other? Oh, sorry. Yeah, let's let Rachel in and then we'll come back. Just a quick two finger, which is that I'm Rachel not even sure. Oh, sorry, Rachel yeah. Kleinfeld, uh, Carnegie Endowment, and uh, Kappus. Um, I'm not even sure that it was really cognitive power that evolved in a coercive power because I think it really is almost impossible to relax the status and lineage um, uh, 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 couching for when you use the Mead example, for instance. You don't know what his initial status was. Why did people begin going to him? If you look at the ages um, when Herodotus writes, so he ruled for 53 years. He would have started in his late teens or early 20s adjudicating disputes. That's when he would have been physically powerful, of course. But you don't go to a teenager for wisdom, generally. And so perhaps he had high status in that community. So I, I think you can't abstract as much as you have and, and get to the state building that you're trying to get to. Last comments from the... I had a question for them. I do too, so... <laughs> <laughs> so this is just about evidence. So so I would have thought in the Athenian case that in the fourth century that that what they... the credit was a big issue. That is, in other words, if you're going to get stuff from the black... they, they got grain from the black sea, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a long shipping, so, so somebody's got to, you know, pay for that somehow. There's going to be, you know... Uh, contracts for kind to have delivery now and essentially apply the bone someplace. So, so I would set, set, think a big reason for making it possible for these people to appear as litigants is to, first of all, be able to enforce their contracts, and secondly, therefore, be willing to loan. So, I would have the aim is to expand credit, essentially, to allow transactions, long distance transactions. So, cool. so and, and I would have thought that you, first of all, you have evidence of that because you know something about economic trade between 
distant ports in Athens, you know, which is not direct evidence on the loans, but it's certainly direct evidence on the activity. So you can actually date that, it seems to me. Yes. You know, so, so, but then secondly, isn't it, I, I thought there were at least some kinds of evidence of commercial, you know, of this kind of phenomenon, that is a, an actual credit game was an issue. You know, was, I mean, I'm just wondering, if, the shift, is there nothing? The fundamental there? shift is that as, as population of Attica increases, the carrying capacity uh, becomes a problem. And so you need trade in order to get grain rails, and the, the, the fundamental trade route is with Bosphorus. It's yeah. with New York. And so what you see in the 4th century, what you see in the 5th century, is that with the empire, people come to Piraeus because they have to. Like there are, like the, the empire forces people into coming to Piraeus. Right, right. And then you have the really interesting time when, when the position, the geopolitical position of Athens at the end of the 5th century is jeopardized by the, by the loss of the Peloponnesian War. And you see a lot of like uh, Bos Bosphorum Parentates sending gifts, right? And, but that is like, that is not sustainable. And what is going on in the fifth century is that the, the how are we going to go? Uh, how are we going to get those uh, gifts? How are we going to get grain into the port? Um, and uh, since the, the, you can't you can't keep on asking the king of Bosphorus to do that, you need to encourage traders to bring the the grain to Braves in the absence of the courses courses of such of the empire. So the story of of Athenian policy in the fourth century vis-a-vis -vis Braves is one of lowering transaction costs in the map in the marketplace. And one of uh, allowing, like, um, uh, expanding access to institution, particularly to categories of people that are involved in maritime trade. I agree with you that you can see the uh, uh, immediate connection between uh, <coughs> and uh, trade, but the two are not mutually exclusive. No, no, I can't violate my rule. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's we started early, and we're going to end a minute early. So. Thank you for a great panel, and it sounds like there will be lots more discussion over our break.